One of the reasons I wanted to come here tonight was to discuss our future. Of course. I plan on running for office someday. Warner. I think we should break up. What? Oh. <laughs> if I'm going to be a senator, I need someone serious. I'm seriously in love with you. I love you. Liar! This is the type of girl that Warner wants to marry. A law student. Going to Harvard is the only way I'm going to get the love of my life back. For my admissions essay, Action. I'm going to tell all of you why I'm going to make an amazing lawyer. I feel comfortable using legal jargon in everyday life. I object. Her list of extracurricular activities is impressive. She was in a Ricky Martin video. Aren't we always looking for diversity? Welcome to Harvard. Don't be scared. Everyone will love you. No. Uh, I'm sorry, are you here to see me? I go here. You got into Harvard Law? What, like it's hard? I got a PhD from Berkeley. MBA from Wharton. I've been deworming orphans in Somalia. Two weeks ago, I saw Cameron Diaz at Fred Siegel, and I talked her out of buying this truly heinous Angora sweater. <laughs> Malibu Barbie lives. I've come to join your study group. Our group is full. Oh, is this like an RSVP thing? No, it's like a smart people thing. I give her two more weeks. What is this? We're betting to see how much longer you're going to last. You're not smart enough, sweetie. I'll show you how valuable Elle Woods can be. MGM Pictures presents... Do you have a resume? It's pink. And it's Senate. I think it gives it a little something extra. A comedy about knowing who you are. You think she just woke up one morning and said, I think I'll go to law school today. And showing what you've got. We're defending Brooke Window. You can buy her exercise tapes on infomercials. Wait! Exercise gives you endorphins. Endorphins make you happy. Happy people just don't shoot their husbands. You're fired. What? I have new representation. Reese Witherspoon. Do you remember when we spent those four amazing hours in the hot tub after winter formal? This is so much better than that. Legally Blonde. Oh, look how cute. There's like a judge in everything. Not for Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Saturday Matinee, presented by the Denver Public Library. Today, we will begin as usual with a brief land acknowledgement, a way for us to honor the indigenous peoples and return the narrative back to the original stewards of this land. We recognize that we are occupying indigenous land in America that is now called Colorado. It's historically inhabited by 48 contemporary tribal nations, specifically Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. 574 federally recognized tribes exist in the United States, and we commit to disrupting invisibility and ongoing erasure of indigenous communities. We want to express our gratitude for the ability to live and meet on these territories and for the past and current contributions of indigenous people. This morning, we are discussing the iconic 2001 comedy starring Reese Witherspoon, Legally Blonde. Submit your comments and questions in the chat and we will ask the most relevant ones to our panel in the last 10 to 15 minutes. This discussion is being recorded and will be available for delayed viewing on YouTube. Nothing apart from the host and the panelist videos is captured or posted. Be sure to keep your microphone on until off <laughs> until the end. My name is Daria and my co-host's name is Andrew. Please message us directly if you're having technical issues, we'll do our best to help you out. And now please give it up for our panel, the film critic Walter Chow and writer and comedian Sarah Benincasa. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I am so amazingly beyond stoked and jazzed and all those uh, hip terms that the youngsters are using these days to talk about Legally Blonde, one of my uh, favorite movies that people are always surprised that I love, but what is not to love about one of the great screwball comedies of the modern era. So you may wonder, what a screwball comedy is. Well, the term originated with a, a kind of baseball pitch. It's a screwball. It, uh, you know, if you watched the old Looney Tune cartoons, you know, the one, two, three strike, strikes you're out sort of uh, that sketch with the ball going super slow. Uh, I, I'm being very vague, but if you're of a certain age, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It began there. It's sort of a pitch that is unorthodox, that doesn't follow traditional pitching rules. It was coined in terms of, in relation to film, with uh, the actress Carol Lombard. Somebody saw her on the set of the 20th Century, this great film from 1934, and said, hey, who's that screwball dame? 
And so it stuck. And the whole subgenre of comedy that kind of began around that period of time became known as screwball comedies. Over 200 of them were made between 1930 and 1940. So what is a screwball comedy? As we have sort of discussed during the course of the last year or two, almost two years now of doing this program, uh, thank you pandemic for never, never stopping, um, is, is the, that things don't happen in a vacuum. Movements in film don't happen in a vacuum. There are, are almost always, there are always, I'm gonna not hedge my bets. There are always reasons that things happen the way that they do, especially when they happen in clusters. The three inciting incidents for screwball comedy are the Great Depression, uh, the great silent comedians and the legacy of the Max Sennett Studios, the Marx Brothers and, 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 and the, those uh, artists. And then the introduction of the production code in 1934. So from the Great Depression and screwball comedies, we have this, this concern about the class divide. Uh, it's usually always economic in the 1930s, of course, with the Great Depression. And it shows the rich as not any smarter than anybody else. They're silly. They're often stupider. They're, they're certainly less empathetic. And into the middle of, uh, of these rich uh, one percenters, you're introduced this one person, this, this chaos agent, usually a woman who infiltrates the ranks of the social uh, hoity-toity and shows them to be the fools that they are uh, because their comedies, they usually end with a romance, they end with sort of a reconciliation. And, uh, but, but that's where we get the Great Depression as a source. Um, there's a, a, a key thing to remember about that element of it, the infiltration of the social hierarchy is that it's always very easy. It's just uh, someone wearing a dress or someone affecting an accent or someone just saying that they're from uh, Harvard, for instance. It's very easy. And there's that great line in Legally Blonde too, where the uh, caddish boyfriend says, uh, you got into Harvard? And she's like, what, like it's hard? So that's a very key element <clears throat> of, of the screwball comedy. Another one are, is those farcical situations, the slapstick element of it. Uh, it's a fairy tale. It's larger than life. It is not meant to be taken strictly seriously. In fact, the original ending of Legally Blonde, it was, a, it was an entire musical number on the steps of the courthouse after the end of, uh, after the, the verdict is returned. And the last thing, the introduction of the production code forced all of the really sexy stuff going on in, in pre-code, especially between 1932 and 1934, forced all of that into the dialogue. So you'll find in screwball comedies this really dense dialogue of one-liners. Uh, one critic described it as sex without sex which is what it is. And this rising and falling of action and rhythms and, you know, people are really in the heat of it. There's a, a great line from broadcast news where William Hurt, the uh, uh, terrible human being in real life, but it, 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 in the movie, he hears the producer played by Holly Hunter in his ear and he describes it as, it was like great sex, the rhythm of it. And she's just talking in his ear. So the, the, the idea of screwball here created in the 1930s, you know, this, this, this wealth of masterpieces finds its, resurrection in a way in 2001. And we'll talk a little bit about how um, Legally Blonde is not so much about uh, infiltration of an economic class, but rather in, in, uh, infiltration of an intellectual or social class, uh, which is an interesting little twist about it. Um, if you're not familiar with screwball comedies, very quickly, uh, a few titles to get into. Gene Harlow in Bombshell, amazing. Gene Arthur, who Every time I say her name, I get a little shiver and all the hairs rise up on my on the back of my neck. I love Jean Arthur so much. And I, I figured out at one point, um, one of many di digressions, sorry, Sarah, I'm introducing you soon, I promise. Whenever I mention Jean Arthur, I realize that I'm not in love with her exactly, I but I would like to be her. Jean Arthur is my, um, my, my, my goal, my end form. Anyway, uh, she, she's in a lot of them. She's always playing someone who is smarter than the job that she's in. She's almost always fired, it seems like, in her movies, and she always infiltrates uh, all, all the snobs and the, and the hoity-toities, and she shows them who's really in, in charge here. Uh, more Than a Secretary, highly recommend. Easy Living, I love it. And a great movie she did with John Wayne called Lady Takes a Chance, directed by William Cedar. Give it a look if you're a fan. Uh, she's just incredible. Carol Lombard, of course, the, the, the 20th century. Uh, the great director, Mitchell Leeson, did a lot of work during here, including a movie called Midnight from 1939, directed by, um, by him, but starring Cla Claudette Colbert. Uh, re re remember the Night, which is my favorite Christmas movie. Uh, I try to watch it every year. Uh, it's amazing. It's Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray. Yes, that Fred McMurray. Um, so many. Bringing a Baby, My Man Godfrey, It Happened One Night, Someone like Got Hot. I could go on, and, and I tend to, so I'm not going to anymore. Instead, 
I'm going to shift gears to introduce our guest today, who who chose League Week One and, and brilliantly. And she's a, a an author and actor. She's a podcaster and creator. She has a podcast right now called Well, This Isn't Normal, uh, which is which is really great. Her last book is called Real Artists Have Jobs, which is a really bracing and important work, I think, if you're an artist, because uh, she sort of de romanticizes the uh, act of being an artist, a creative in, in the modern uh, conversation. She used to have a web series, or she may still on YouTube, I'll ask her, it's called uh, Getting Wet with Sarah Benincasa, which I love, uh, and, and she uh, does all of these interviews from her bathtub. Um, it's full, it's not just an empty bathtub, she's in a bathtub with all, all of her guests, uh, and, and, and including Childish Gambino, uh, young Mr. Glover, uh, Margaret Cho, you know, so all my cultural heroes she's had in a bathtub with her, which is Pretty freaking cool. On uh, October 6th, she's in conversation with the author, Lori Wolliver, about her new book, Bourdain. Uh, Lori's new book, Bourdain, about Anthony Bourdain, which she's interviewed dozens and dozens of people about him. And we all miss uh, Anthony quite a lot. Um, where I got interested in Sarah Benincasa, in addition to all of these great things that she does, but I really got interested in her was two things. One, in 2018, I think, she put out a bounty, a $300 bounty to any journalist who would ask Donald Trump, uh, what our relationship with the African nation of Wakanda, where the Black Panther is from, was like. I'm not sure anybody cashed in on that. If I was a journalist, I would have asked him the first day. But the other thing that really got me um, hyped about Sarah was her openness about her own struggles with depression, with uh, agoraphobia. Her first book, it's a memoir called Agora Fabulous. Uh, and, and, but her openness with mental illness, her openness with depression, including thoughts of uh, of suicide uh, really struck a nerve with me uh, that this is a person who is out there completely um, and vulnerable and in such a way that it makes a big difference, I think, among people who still see this as something to be ashamed of or don't exactly know where to turn to. Um, here's a person who is extraordinarily articulate about writing about that struggle. She's written two, four books, Agora Fabulous, Great, DC Trip, and Real Artists Have Day Jobs, the subtitle for which is and other awesome things they don't teach you in school. Um, here's a passage I want to read as I introduce Sarah that she's written recently for Medium. Uh, it really tore me apart a little bit. Hopefully, you know, it doesn't bring it down too much. We're talking about Legally Blonde. There's enough endorphins to balance this out. This is written from a perspective of somewhere in the far future that presuming that we survived, we're telling our great great grandchildren and uh, other people, great 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 grandchildren about what we've we're going through right now. Here it goes. If I am honest, I will say, in those days, I would wonder why I was sad suddenly and exhausted when I was lucky to have a place to live and clean water and a job and a benevolent demon cat and a family and friends and my books and my poetry to protect me. I would wonder if the wave of despair could simply be by a chemical, if maybe I needed to take more medication, do more exercise, drink more water, pray on my hands and knees more than once a day instead of just once, half awake each morning. I would wonder what I could do to produce the right response. And then I would remember how life works for humans. And I would think to be sad and frightened and weary is the right response. People are dying. People are in pain. I can do some of the helpful things, the good habits, the healthy behaviors, and I must do them. But sometimes the bad feelings will come in. This is the nature of the time. I can hold hope in my heart and anger too and rage and the love alike can weigh me down. This is not a failure to heal, but an affirmation that I am alive, that I am real, that I am still here. And to be here means to be present for all of it, all of it. And so these were the days when I learned to be there for all of it because I could hide from the illness as best as I could, but I could not hide from the way I felt about it. Do you see? That's Sarah Benincasa. And I'm so excited to have her here today. Sarah, welcome Sarah to Manet. That is so kind of you, Walter. I'm so, like what an absolute joy to be here with you with such a, a kind intro. And as the daughter of a longtime librarian in the state of New Jersey to, to be here with the Denver Public Library, um, to be at an event that takes time to give an acknowledgement to the indigenous peoples of the land now known as Colorado. Like that is awesome. You all are really doing it. And one of my favorite book tour stops ever was at um, Tattered Cover in 2014 for a book I did called Great. Uh, I'm in Brooklyn, New York right now. So uh, there are handsome motorcycle men who 
live in a house together and have motorcycles and are handsome uh, across the street. And, and on Saturday, that's their handsome motorcycle man day, uh, which sounds exciting and it is, but if there's noise, I apologize for that. But um, yeah, just what I was just actually, um, I was texting with uh, a friend of mine through whom I met Karen McCullough, who's one of the, the co-writers of the, the film. And I, I was sit letting him know about this, even though I'm sure he's busy, but um, I said, uh, like, damn, we need art right now. And, and I was just saying how much it warms me to be here with, you know, 60 participants, uh, strangers mostly, I'm sure, to each other, although I'm sure some friends made a date to come see this uh, because of the love for Legally Blonde. So it's just a real joy and, and talk about a mental health boost, like film, music, television, great books. We are so fortunate to have access to them and, and, and the public library system obviously provides free access, which is so, so, so important. So I'm just thrilled to be here. I've got a cold brew coffee with um, a shot of espresso in it, which I believe is, is it, it creates artificially the feeling you get from watching Legally Blonde. <laughs> And I'm a, I'm a sober person, so this is like the only drug that I'm allowed to do uh, is is caffeine. So I'm ready to rock. I'm stoked. I feel like they should regulate caffeine at some point because I drink like a, you know. Yeah, we shouldn't be allowed to have as much caffeine. It's as it's we, not as we it's, do. it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the big question I always ask our guests first is why did you pick this movie? Why Legally Blonde? I think I picked it because I had just been at a party with Karen honestly, which sounds very like fancy pantsy, but I'm not, you know, I, I have a full-time day job. Like I write sometimes, I, I just wrote on a few episodes of um, Mystery Science Theater 3000, uh, which I'm excited about the next season, but I'm not like a, you know, I mean, uh, my, uh, you know, my apartment is 523 square feet and that's pretty nice, right? It's in, it's in an expensive place, but I, it's, uh, I'm not like a fancy Hollywood person, you know what I mean? I just have some nice friends. I used to be a stand-up comic and I always say that if you, one of the best things that I ever, I had ever did was make, consistently make friends with people vastly more talented than me, not hard, but also with a better work ethic. And, you know, sometimes they go on to fame and fortune and then you get to meet fancy people and you get to eat free stuff at their house, which is great. So anyway, I, uh, I, I happened to meet Karen um, through a mutual friend. And I think she was on my mind because she's just, such a she and and Kiwi Smith Kirsten Smith have co-written a lot of stuff together they've written stuff individually they did the house bunny as well they did Ella Enchanted um they did gosh a lot a 10 things I hate about you uh which like Le like Legally Blonde also an adaptation a lot of people don't know Legally Blonde it's based on underlying material although they very much made it their own um but you know when it's Shakespeare you don't have to add, pay for the rights so that was probably pretty cool but uh, I think I think that Karen was just on my mind as like a groovy, sexy, funny broad. She's a great storyteller. Uh, so I think that's why, honestly. I think I was just thinking about her. Yeah, you know, uh, th th there's an extraordinary amount that they bring to their works. I really love 10 Things I Hate About You. I really like The House Bunny. You know, I, I, I like their movies and I think it's it's worthwhile to unpack them because I think if you're not watching movies like that, it, you it's easy to dismiss them. I was like, oh, it's another stupid comedy. It's another one of those yeah. things. It's another one of those. But, you know, it, it's so affirming. It, it's, it's that, you know, word. It's very feminist. You know, and let's talk about how it is. You know, let's talk about the body positivity elements of it and the self-confidence of this character. Let's start with Reese Witherspoon. And, you know, she was, she was the, 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 the first person that they wanted to be in this movie. But the studio didn't want her because of her role in election. And they sort of thought that that was her. And when she had to come and do all these auditions and do all the stuff, um, and, and you know the advice that she got along the way was dress sexy for these auditions. So something to think about as you know, what is the hurdle? Let me ask you, Sarah. What is the hurdle for movies like this to get get made that have all of these messages about female friendship and positivity? Why is it so hard? You know, I mean, as far as my experience goes with having adapted a couple of my books for film and TV. And they, they never got made, but I got paid. So I got to do the union, which is great. Um, and, and that's, I always say, I didn't know before I, I got into um, the, the, this, this world that um, 
I mean, I know many successful screenwriters who've never had a, a picture make it to theaters who bought houses. Because for these studios, it's a rounding error to throw what to a lot of us is a bunch of money at somebody. Be like, figure this out. Oh, we don't like that. And, and, and the person can spend years of their life trying to bring a story to screen. Um, and so it can be heartbreaking for them. But I'm like, yeah, but you do get a check. But a real artist really wants to tell those stories, right? They want the stories to get out there. So when we look at a story like this, I think that while we do bump up on some things that would, would you know, not be in a film today necessarily, and there, there, are, some, there are some moments in the film where you're like, eh. um, most of it, I mean, I think it all holds up entirely. I think it's very much of its time. But this is not a film where uh, one woman tries to murder the other. <laughs> And I think that quite often when we're looking at, at films with characters, honestly, whether they're cis women, trans women, if there's a woman or a femme, if you got two women or femmes, right, in a film, the idea I think would be that they are um, either in competition or one of them is the glorious superstar and the other one is sort of a weirdo sidekick. It's, it's rare to see a film in which obviously you have a lead and you have sort of secondary characters but it's it's rare to see a film in which as with Reese Witherspoon's character and Jennifer Coolidge's character um from the jump they are on board with each other and they are bonding and they come from different class and they come from different um parts of the country and they come from different levels of education and different levels of privilege for sure and yet they just instinctively love each other and they bond over, I know I'm sort of, I'm not exactly answering your question appropriately, um, but it, it just, or exactly, but it just occurred to me like, they bond over pain. They bond over the experience of pain at, at the hands of a gentleman caller. And uh, <laughs> they, but they grow to, they believe in each other and they love each other. And it doesn't, one of the reason I, reasons I think Elle Woods is so charming is that it doesn't matter to her if somebody has less money or if they are not considered as conventionally attractive as she is or, or any of these things. She has this very strong innate sense of justice. And as much as it's a silly movie, it's also a really loving movie. And to circle back to your question, I think that sometimes I, I could see a studio executive going, and I don't know if this happened in, in their case, but I can see them going, but she and Selma Blair's character, they, they end up friends at the end. That, that doesn't make sense. Women don't do that. Or wait, but, but we, don't see, we don't see her at a wedding at the end. How is it a, a real comedy if we don't see her happily married? Like we, we do find out that she's getting engaged, but it doesn't end on her kissing Luke Wilson. That's not like what, you know, we don't, I don't even think we even, do we even see her kissing Luke Wilson in the, in the film? No, it, it, was, it was originally written and shot, actually, that they, they share a kiss. That, that's the end of the movie, right? And, yeah. and it's a traditional thing. And as they were screening it, the test audience were, were telling them, they were like, I don't think this movie is about her getting a boyfriend. It's not. So they, exactly. Thank God. That's right. It's not. And so they, they had, a, had another, uh, you know, a, a moment of her giving a, a commencement speech. You know, she, that, that, that's really yeah. what the movie is about. Is her, and stepping into her know. intelligence. Like, that's, an, that's I guess... The, we can, you know, obviously this is a very privileged character who's coming into this world with, we're in a world where she has a lot of power and where the worst thing that's ever happened to her is getting rejected by a guy who's quite frankly, a jerk. But what I think is sort of deeply relatable to a lot of people is that we have this main character who's always underestimated and who is thought to be um, stupid or decorative or inconsequential. And I think a lot of us, even though we don't look like Reese Witherspoon, for whatever reason, different reasons, have been underestimated and felt that we were considered to be frivolous, stupid, unlovable. And, and so I think that that is what a lot of people continue to connect with. And I think Kiwi and, and Karen write so... Um, there's a lot of warmth there and there's real tenderness there. And they slip in a lot of these conversations in there, you know, underneath the radar almost. There's the line that looks like post-production kind, you know, um, after he, she's uh, gone out to meet Raquel Welch for the first time and they're driving back Luke Wilson and, 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 and 
you know, the very handsome Emmett and, and Elle are driving back from it. And they have the conversation and she's like, she's lying, you know, and he's like, you're stereotyping her in the same way that you're stereotyped. You know, and there, that's a little moment that's not ne- not really necessary for the film, but it's so m- mature. Or just like having the Selma Blair character, you know, say, "I've made a really terrible mistake," and own that moment. The, the, these it's the reason I like Ted Lasso. Is like you you have these adults um, taking accountabil- accountability for their actions, and I'm so hungry for that now. <laughs> that you know because after five years or something of seeing nobody being held accountable for anything it's almost like you know religious grace to see somebody apologize to see somebody say i, I made a mistake and, and this movie is peppered with that yeah and some of blair's character i'm sorry i just stepped on you but i was just step on me such a good point that you just made some of blair's character as i'm thinking about it she she is um if you think about it, this is somebody who they dated um, Warner, which is so funny. It's the same as Warner, but Reese Witherspoon's like Tennessee accent comes through <laughs> only, it only kind of comes through on certain vowels and it comes through where she constantly calls him Warner. So it's like, <laughs> but um, it's so, it's so great. But so Selma Blair's character and Warner, I forget the actor's name. I need to look at him. He does a great job embodying this just like, just this un this sort of really thankless role in a sense he's just such a a d bag uh if i may and uh, but um matthew davis he's so great in this role but so vivian selma blair's character she's very like as written on the page she could have just come off as a bully and that does happen but what you also sort of start to see she vivian dated warner in um prep school warner went off to college and got a beautiful like california barbie doll girlfriend for four years dumps her um and then gets engaged to his high school girlfriend over the summer because they're stuffy new england people and i guess that's in this world what stuffy new england people do um and selma blair's character like it's very clear and i think this is a credit to selma blair's performance that when she walks into um Elle's room after she notices that Elle is not going to take any crap from the lawyer for whom they're interning she grows to have respect for her and you can see through some of Blair's performance she's like tentative and kind of insecure about this glamorous creature and she really starts to have respect for her even though of course later she makes the mistake of jumping to an assumption about the sexual harassment that's taking place but I think Selma Blair does such a wonderful job of being unlikable, but really sort of informing that performance with this girl feels insecure about her situation, rightfully so. Yeah, well, that's sort of the type rope that a lot of these characters are walking. It's very easy to dislike L. I mean, it, you know, it's very easy to dislike someone like that in my mind, you know, like, oh, she's so surface and everything. But um, the way that Witherspoon plays her, and she's got a real gift for this. Uh, you're instantly, instantly on her side because you do see that kind of kindness and authenticity and strength too. I love how she doesn't just take being dumped quietly. You expect that scene, you know, because men will, you know, bad men like Werner will 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 take you out in public to dump you because they feel like they'll insulate them from the scene, and they don't want it to have any kind of emotional work there, you know, with with with, with that moment. And she doesn't have any of it. She's com- completely um, confident. And herself and righteous in her reaction uh to, to to being dumped this way i love that and and the 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 even the character of enid the uh the uh, lesbian who accuses her of uh, uh, of calling her a, a terrible word and, and, and she's broken she's hurt there there's a moment where i feel like with each of these characters that i feel like okay there's a human being underneath these caricatures and that's something that i didn't expect i expected the caricatures i didn't expect the depth of development through performance script through whatever with each of these characters where i don't hate anybody you know, yeah i mean movie. Enid expects to be bullied by this woman who fits the conventional you know white cis heterosexual blonde american waspy 
California Barbie doll hot chick mold, right? So Enid has probably been bullied by people like this, and that's very clear. And I think that, you know, the actress, um, I think it's Meredith Scott Lynn, who is that. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, and she does a great job. It's a caricature of a role. It's goofy, but she does a great job sort of in, embodying that, like, reflexive kind of rage. And you know who I think is just, for me, an unsung hero of this movie is Linda Cardellini as Chutney. First of all, Chutney is an amazing name <laughs> for a pretentious New England um, kid, but also Chutney, the daughter who actually did the murder by accident. She's like, Linda Cardellini is giving you pathos, sadness, agony. Like she's, she's serving tears in the eyes about to freak out when she's like, did, you know, did, did, did you know she was my age? How would you feel? It's Linda Cardellini is almost in a different movie in that moment. Like she's giving full on dramatic commitment in the moment where she reveals herself. And Reese Witherspoon is always in the same movie. I mean, you're going to get like amazing consistency from her and everybody else is in the same. And all of a sudden Linda Cardellini is just like in there with a Greek tragic performance and it's just great. I love it at the end. And the way that hair and makeup did her hair so aggressively large to like point out, like this person has a perm and this film is going to hinge on Reese Witherspoon's character's understanding of perm technology. It's so over the top. And then you have Linda Cardellini just like really delivering this sort of like electra complex situation happening. I just love it so much. It well, takes you know, the movie every time and it's great. It's, it's over the top, but it also hits on a really interesting thing about this film, too, is like it, it is a detective story that hinges on a woman's knowledge. Yes. Um, and, and, it's, and, and different kinds of knowledge as being valued equally uh, in this movie, which is also rare. You know, usually it's used as some sort of like, oh, your women's intuition, like a North by Northwest or something. It's used as something that's dismissive or diminishing. It really reminds me of a play by Sarah Glassbell called Trifles. Are you familiar with that play? Uh, it's it's you know an old. It's set in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Uh, a husband has been killed or has killed himself. They're not sure. These men come in and they're investigating the big sheriff and everything. And all the women of the town they come in and they notice little things about, you know, the dish towel is misplaced and this is different. So they notice all of these domestic details and they figure out the solution of the crime and then they hide the evidence so that they they free the their the their peer the woman That's it's about woman's cool. it's amazing it's a woman's knowledge and i think so much of screwball and i love it so much is because it centers on a woman who is shocker equal to men or superior to men and that's rare and it's all kind of in this the backlash to, to screwball comedy is film noir where women because of that are very dangerous but you know during the, the screwball period and, and in legally blonde a woman's knowledge is actually superior to male knowledge can you talk to me a little bit about different kinds of knowledge and legally blonde, like Prada shoes and things like that. Yeah, I think that she notices the witch. She knows a lot about beautifying because she's been raised to be decorative by her parents who talk down to her. And a great line early on is when her mother says something to the effect of, honey, you're Miss Hawaiian Tropics. Are you sure you want to give all that up? Her parents are these kind of ghoulish, garish people. And even at the very end of the film, which is the next time we see the parents, they're still, you know, dressed in all their finery. And her father has a martini with olives in it, in a glass, like holding it up. Like, uh, like suddenly they're proud of her, but they're, her parents, she doesn't relate to her parents at all. Like they have, Elle is very, very smart. She notices a lot of things and she doesn't take kindly to being spoken down to, but she's also clearly used to it. So when she's early on in the film, she's looking for a dress to go on her, um, her date with Warner where she thinks she's going to get proposed to and she gets dumped. And there's a woman, a brunette woman, uh, in, the, in the salon, or excuse me, in the, in the dress shop who tries to cheat her. And Elle has such a comprehensive knowledge of fashion merchandising and fashion production that she realizes that the dress the woman's trying to sell her is actually super cheap. And so... That's she knows a lot about. I mean, she got like a 4.0 in I think fashion merchandising was her, her major. So she actually has a great understanding of business and she has a great understanding of the things we use to ornament ourselves to present as femme. 
um, in an ex a way that is conventionally accepted circa 2001 movie world. And so she is able to, she doesn't come from the world of intellectual inquiry. And she is able to really like stand out and ultimately impresses a character who is a little bit underused. The, the professor played by Holland Taylor, the great and powerful Holland Taylor, who's great in every, in, in every um, moment is like, you know, a little bit over the top in a wonderful way. And um, so she earns the respect of those around her because Elle Woods knows what she's good at. And even though she does have a self-doubt thanks to her um, undermining uh, one-time boyfriend, but, but she knows what she's good at. And she, and, and it, it, she has very little self-doubt. She has some in the film, but, but overall very little. She just knows she can do whatever she wants to, which makes sense because this is probably a character who hasn't um, faced any stumbling blocks in her life. I mean, she's uh, all the different things that I said from aspects of race and class and privilege and all those things. Um, but, but women who come from that background are still generally trained at least in the world of this film, to be decorative and to, for their highest aspiration, we are told in the film, sort of as portrayed through her hilarious sorority sisters, is, is to be wed to a good man, not even a good man, uh, a powerful or wealthy man. So, so she is still subverting the expectations of the other people in the film. And um, it just, she, she, her, she does not doubt her own intellect, even though it hasn't necessarily been challenged in certain ways that do happen in the film. And it's very cool to see her. I mean, that moment of like, what? Like, it's hard? Yeah. Like, she doesn't doubt that she can do it. At least not until he does a number on her mentally. Right. So I had this moment in The Devil Wears Prada where I, uh, it was one of those eureka moments where I'm like, you know, I, I, I pride myself on being pretty smart about social issues and, and the world and signs and signifiers. You know, I'm a, I'm a smart man who has a lot of student debt. And so, yeah, I, I, you know, but in the, in the middle of Devil Wears Prada, I was like, wait a minute, I have zero understanding about fashion. I have zero understanding about how trends are predicted, how they are manipulated, how they predict certain social movements, certain aspects of, of, of how things go, you know, how things run. And it's a huge, huge gap. It's not a small gap and a, and a ridiculous gap. It's a huge gap in my knowledge and my education, my understanding of the world. You know, for her to be able to say, that was last season or that was this season or that was, the, you know, that, that's not just silly. There's this something, it's a billion dollar industry that relates to all of us. It impacts us whether we understand that it impacts us or not. You know, people are making judgments about you and about the things that you do without have me having any kind of understanding about the foundational thing of that. And what Legally Blonde also challenges for me, kind of, is this idea that, you know, she's going to law school and the only person I hate, I'm going to retract, I don't hate anybody. I do hate the professor that hits on her. You know, uh, in the fantastic Victor Garber. Yeah, he's great, but he's terrible. You know, he, he represents every, you know, he represents the, the, the Jeopardy guy. He's like every he's mediocre... Like you know, quite, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, so, but um, it, it's like there's a challenge now with Legally Blonde that says that all of these male dominated systems of knowledge that we privilege are perhaps um, only half of the story. That there's actually a whole world, 51%, uh, that we are blind to because we want to diminish it. So, that, that sort of deprioritization, that de equalization of, of, um, of, Anything that's feminized, that's coded as feminine in, in, in our patriarchy, is something that Legally Blonde, I think, really goes after in, in a direct way, in a, in a brilliant way, um, to say that she's not stupid at all. She is actually a genius, but in a way that you don't understand and you don't value. And she, when she's confronted with things that are outside of her general purview, um, she just accepts it and rolls with it. And you know, I would like to think because we'd like to project on, we like to project things onto beloved characters. I would like to think that, that, you know, today Elle Woods, let's see, I'm, I'm 40. She would be like uh, 44 or 45, I think. 
um, if the real Elle Woods would be like, you know, would have friends, would have a more diverse friend base and uh, would like know, uh, you know, would know people who weren't white, that would be cool for her. Uh, but I think that she would probably have a, a, a much more diverse worldview and friend base, but, but the character I think wouldn't like blink at, she wouldn't, it wouldn't be, um, I don't see the character as somebody who's like, and this is my lesbian friend. This is my trans friend. Like Elle Woods as written and as portrayed in the, in the film is not like a TV movie of the week treacly kind of vehicle through which we learn about equality, right? Like she just is like, this is who I am. Oh, this is who you are. Okay, cool. Um, great. We're going to now go and get your dog back. <laughs> very she definitely would be doing a lot of i think legal work legal aid pro bono work on behalf of like um animal shelters and like uh, animal, like l woods loves loves animals loves humans who are also animals um just sort of has a very inclusive worldview although she does decide that somebody is gay based on the fact that they know what a designer is um, I feel like Elle Woods today would be <laughs> have a different sense of things, but she's just, you know, it's, it's, it's just a delightful movie. And I was, how old was I? I was 20 when it came out, I guess. Um, what, what was the release date? It was 2001. It was, I mean, the summer, first, it was summer, sure it was the summer. First, yeah. first big movie that came out after 9-11 was Zoolander and it was delayed because they had to do some like editing um, as a lot of films at that time did that had shots of the skyline of New York City. This was before that. This was like sort of a last breath of, oh, is it really, I'm looking for the release date exact. I don't know. What, I mean, I know it was, it, it was summer, but um, I also think that there was a conversation at that time and in the years after about films that came out that year and that became particularly beloved. And that some, which did well in theaters and did super well on DVD and VHS. Um, and I think if I recall correctly, that watching Legally Blonde with friends on DVD and having little parties and really enjoying it and all that stuff was a very much a thing in 2002 and 2003. There was this kind of appetite for silly smart comedies um, during that time. And also, that was also uh, the year Amelie like became super beloved, right? Yeah, I think it was. And you know, they're, they're, the, the, the interesting thing about Legally Blonde as well is like, it's more than just a fun movie. It actually inspired a lot of people, a lot of young women to go to law school. Um, you know, it, 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 it's one of those movies that has a uh, remarkable wake. That, that it's left in so many different ways. It's message, this ge it's general message of empowerment. I was like, you can do these things that you've been told that you can't do. Like to your point, her parents don't, you know, people that go to Harvard are boring and serious and you're not any of those things. Also ugly, you're not any of those things, you know, it, but she, uh, she wants to go and she can go and she has the support of you know i actually got misty this time watching this movie we were talking about this earlier when the whole house her whole sorority gathers around for her to open her letter about whether or not she gets she um gets the score that she needs for the lsat I, that's an experience that's foreign to me you know when i was growing up and going to college and everything i had all those test results i didn't want to talk to anybody about it especially not my parents I did not have that kind of support system and to see that support system so genuinely offered is remarkable and you see throughout the course of the film with her and paulette and all those things it's extraordinarily kind talking about two, these um, yes and her two best friends from the sorority like it's one of the only depictions of the sorority that i've ever seen that's aggressively non-competitive internally mm -hmm. and no one's trying to displace her to destroy her or anything like that and the the two best friends who are hilarious and one of the actresses in particular who plays one of her best friends is just to see who it is. I just loved her performance so much. It's she doesn't get a ton of screen time, but there's enough to help set up the character. And it's the Jessica, Jessica Caulfield. Caulfield, she's mm -hmm. so great, so good, and so endearing, and so funny. And they just love. They just love. They don't understand what Elle's doing, and they're they don't care because she wants it, and they just love their friend, and they want her to be happy. And when they show up at the end 
Well, it's hilarious. They're so excited to show up for her trial. Presumably, Elle notified them the day or two days before that she was going to be the representation in this moment. And these girls just got a last minute plane ticket and flew across the country and got dressed up and they're so excited. And to them, it's all like a movie set. And they're like, oh, there's a jury and everything. This is so fun. And they're just delight. Like, it's so, it's so affirming. I got a almost, I guess I didn't get emotional, but I, I was very touched by the moment. We talked about this earlier where Reese Witherspoon's character and Jennifer Coolidge's character are sitting in the nail salon when it's winter. And one of the ways that we're shown that time is passing is that it's snowing outside and they're sitting by themselves. It's closed and they're just there bonding. And it's really sweet because at that point, Elle doesn't have any other friends. Um, but she has, you know, she has, she has Paulette and and she, they genuinely enjoy each other so much. And it's great. And like, I, I haven't seen the sequel. Um, I think it involves gay rights and dogs. I don't know. But I just love, I love this. I, a, a lot of the original cast came back, I know, for the sequel. Um, and, and then there's like some threequel that with like, you know, her cousins or something. Um, and uh, which happens when like, you know, people own the rights to something and are like, I guess we can just farm this out and keep this franchise going. But, uh, but the first film is just, I mean, you know. Well, I really love that first meeting between Paulette and Elle where, you know, Elle is crying and needs a little bit of uh, uh, therapy, you know, spa therapy. And Paulette says, um, yeah, I was left. And I'm like, I, I have stretch marks in a big ass. And Elle doesn't offer her any platitudes. He, she doesn't say, oh, no, you, you don't, you you know what? She just listens. And I think there's so much like wisdom in the screenwriting, right? It's like, don't do something that's like facile. That's not what this person needs. Sometimes someone just needs to be heard. You know, my, my, my instinct in all those awkward situations is like, oh, no, you're gorgeous. You're a goddess or whatever, you know, and that's that plays false. It is false. It is just, you know, people's discomfort and showing these characters who are comfortable with each other in that way you know it instantly is like it is affirming it is affirming it's like and and then when they do the bend and 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 pop scene it's like you know which is the, the I hate that right. scene. like i hate that scene i know a lot of people love it i hate that scene so much i'm like where did this come from but it's cute yeah but, it's but but what i like about it is the diversity of the people who are doing the bend and snap it's right? the only place where they're like let's get background uh, i think black people exist <laughs> Let's get right. two black wow. girls. Wow. Like that's the one part in the film where they're like, "Let's do this." And I, <laughs> that's another. I'm just like, uh, "Yes." And for for once, we're like, "Okay, everybody's not white in this movie." It's just something I bumped up on, um, mostly because not because of the. I, I wish I could say it was because uh, I noticed like that the, there was diverse background, but it's it's it's, and I do notice that. But I'm just like, "What is this bend and snap, and why are they doing?" Like I still for 20 years. <laughs> why are they and then this happens I, are we showing our butts in the air like what is the point walter you're a film expert what is the point of the bend and snap narrative from a narrative perspective and also oh. what are we doing with the move are we sticking our butt in the air like what is the and why are we doing this sort of like pterodactyl thing chicken wing tyrannosaurus rex the chicken wing i think what it does chicken. is it's it places the film in the context of like musical theater which is, I think, which is like, which is, I think, where it was kind of headed, and it has headed there now. It's, there's a stage version of it that does have musical numbers, and I, it's I, I think it's this... forever, right? I think Legally Blonde, the musical, has been on stage forever. Oh, yeah, awesome. yeah, 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 and, and and I think that's really the heart of uh, films like this. Really, is is like the, you you are um, heading towards this moment of co co community uplift, and I think that's what maybe that's pointing towards and maybe pointing towards more explicitly the original ending of the film which was never included which does end with a large dance sequence so this sort of sets up that we're in this sort of dance world as a film expert i'd say that but yeah it, it doesn't really fit with the rest of the movie except for the diversity of it that i do like and i will say yeah, great but but you know i will say in 20 years it's great that we notice this now because i'm not sure that's really noticeable in 2001 in 2021, it's really noticeable because we've kind of tried to improve at least secondary or background characters in that respect. You know, um, the, the only place I didn't mind it was when they showed the Harvard panel that that was watching the video, and those are all, all like white, white men. Perfect. That correct. That's exactly right. right. That's fine. 
I have no problem with that casting at all. That's exactly right. <laughs> exactly. And <laughs> would Elle Woods actually, in, in reality, would that character, she probably would be in, I don't remember if her sorority is all white girls, but it probably would have been. And her friend group probably would have been all white folks. Like I think that, they were all white girls. Like, yeah. And the fact that at the, she's at the salon, presumably in Cambridge or Boston, which is an incredibly segregated city, but the, both incredibly segregated cities. But the fact that she's in a salon where there are stylists who are doing like different hair types is actually kind of noteworthy. You know what? I'm coming around on the bend and snap scene. This is really helping me figure out that it's actually a very important <laughs> moment in, in cinema. Um, this is an integrated salon, which you don't often see. I used to work in a salon in Boston in 2001. This is all coming back to me. It's helping me unpack <laughs> some issues. Thank you for this therapy session. But like, because I, that, that makes a lot of sense to me now, because I remember working at that salon in Boston and it was, we had a mixed salon, which is rare to have stylists of different backgrounds doing different hair types. Usually you see pretty segregated salons, not always, but usually. And, wow, oh, you know what? I'm glad that I'm just tripping out on this caffeine and really going back in time. Well, and for, right. Elle to, for Elle to pick a segregated um, salon, you know, uh, <laughs> when she has other choices, yeah, it yeah. says something about her character as well, even if the rest of the film doesn't follow suit. You know what? I've completely revised my feeling about the Ben and Snap scene. We've, we, I, I, we, we've I, done our work today, and that, that's a good place for us to ask if there are any questions from our, uh, from our estimable audience assembled today. Or anybody have any questions for us as we spend the last 10 minutes or so? talking about this great film. Definitely. Robert wanted to know if you guys think that Legally Blonde reverses the male gaze. Hmm. Well, I think that Elle very much occupies the, the, the male, I, the ideal of the traditional right cis male gaze. Um, I think what it does, maybe, and I'm going to step on you, sorry, Sarah. No, go ahead. Throw it back at you in a minute. But it's like, it's not so much the male gaze, I think, that that's hijacked here. But the what, what happens is that we see an example of a film when it's written by women, that there's a, based on a work by a woman, that, you know, that I felt that way about the first Wonder Woman movie, that this script as it was for the first Wonder Woman movie would have been just a really bad movie but because it was directed by Patty Jenkins in the way that it was it became kind of a good movie not not a great movie but a pretty good movie because it's certainly from a different perspective so to take the the gaze idea out of it because that's very specifically about how we objectify objects on the screen if we take that out of it what we see instead is a very feminine perspective of a traditional film and I think that happens when you know because this plot of somebody, you know, from a, the wrong side of the tracks or the wrong place or whatever, infiltrating, a, a, you know, that's hundreds and hundreds of movies are about this. And uh, love occurring between people who don't like themselves at first or like each other at first. And then, you know, all of this stuff. Um, th these are master plots. These are just kind of plug and play Matt, plots. But to have it written by two women and, and you know, directed by a young man is first time out and everything is, I think what we're seeing now is 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 sort of a usurpation of the traditional mode of storytelling. We're used to seeing the two women pitted against each other. We're used to seeing ending with a wedding. We're used to seeing all of these things that, you know, I think men would like to see about women. Sure, she's smart, but she ends up being married to this guy. That's, that's exactly how I'm comfortable with smart women. Or I'm comfortable with two women who are very brilliant and smart and dangerous fighting each other to the death. I really like that. You know, but what if it's rather a young woman who rejects uh, her professor in, in a meaningful way and um, has special knowledge that allows her to defend someone that a man cannot provide. That, you know, she does things that men can't do in this movie. And that's, I think, may, maybe the heart of your question, Robert, is, is yeah, it, it's, a, it, it's a movie, it, it's, it's a woman's movie from a woman's point of view. And I think that's rare, too rare. Um, uh, Sarah, sorry, I jumped on you. No, no, no. I, I think that's really insightful. I was also thinking about how Elle is not, we don't get a lot of, like, like her character, when she brings up to Warner, remember when we had those four amazing hours in the hot tub after blah, blah, blah. This is so much better than that. Um, we don't see her. She's not like, she's not like a horned up character. You know, we don't see her being super sexual 
or sexualized, which is interesting. She's embodying this look that is very seen as very sexy. She's got short skirts and the makeup and the you know hair and everything, but she herself is very her focus is something else. So we really do get to see a character whose focus is not on appearing sexy, even though she is inherently, in my opinion, for different reasons. I know it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, and that's really interesting. We don't get like long lingering shots of her bosom, for example. We get to see her primping in this very sort of, there's something, she has an innocence to her that's, that's kind of cool to see. And I mean, I love a hypersexualized woman character who's super in charge of her own sexuality and all that. It just occurred to me now because of Robert's question, which I think is so interesting, that um, even though we have a, a, a guy directing, we don't get a lot of that, you know, a lot of the stuff that we might see in, in a film, in another kind of film, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, as soon as you start paying attention to how women are introduced for the first time in films, you, you can never unsee it. You know, it's usually like a slow pan up yeah. from... Yes, you foot to, to butt as they're walking into a room or something or you know uh, the the camera becomes lascivious and that's literally yes, that's a good way to put it. Yes, right? yes, and, yes. And, i don't feel like the camera is lascivious nope, in this film. not at all no, i like a horny camera sometimes no shame oh Love please it. but in this one yeah it's and i think that one of the reasons why it's so fun is because you you might expect that with such you know and it's really interesting it's very respectful even that scene where they're they're the harvard boys are playing a pickup football game and she's out there to try to win them back and everything and so she goes out with her her furry arms shawl oh, and her, fun ensemble yeah indeed indeed you know and, and um but it's the, the camera doesn't go up and down her it, it's not lascivious it doesn't you know sexualize her it shows very manipulative on purpose in a great way in that scene Right. It shows her understanding what her sexuality's effect is on others mm -hmm. without indulging in it in the same way. I mean, she's absolutely confident. She has no um, uh, hangups about how she looks. None. And I think that's amazing, too. I, I think we, we have this um, industry that's about that. And, and the great irony that I was trying to sort of hint to earlier on about this film is like to audition for this empowering film she had to wear something sexy. And, you know, you have Ra Ra Raquel Welch, who was essentially, you know, a product of this era in the 60s and 70s of just objectification of her, you know, the 10, 10 million years BC poster and all that stuff with Raquel Welch. For this movie, for her to be in it, she asked for her own cinematographer to do the lighting on her so that she could look a certain way. And, you know, Joan Crawford, Betty yeah. Davis, all the greats did that because they, they knew that their appearance meant everything that was in terms of how they were... Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's no matter how great you are in the role. And Raquel Welch is so funny in this role. She's good. She's, yeah, no, she's perfect. She's she perfect. Yes, and she's also a callback to that sort of abuse, right? Yeah. To that sort of objectifying abuse, and it's kind of presented here as all of these people that are broken by that system, you know, and that whole Cabana Boy thing, and it's just, it's a tragedy that's unfolding in the courtroom there, you know, and 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 just the casting is really smart to bring someone like that in and say. You know, it's, it's almost like casting, you know, for Norma Desmond, you know, to bring in someone who's actually a product of that period and of the abuses of that period to come speak as a person who is uh, bitter about those abuses. I think that's- And there's a moment where, um, where Raquel Welch, this is a very, as a person with curly hair and my hair is like all kind of brushed out and frizzy today, not a real Linda Cardellini perm moment, um, <laughs> but uh, there is a moment where Reese Witherspoon, like, figures out what the deal is and how she's going to use the perm thing and turns she's like you know it's a girl in my sorority has got a perm one her name's Tracy and she's like going on and talking about how we all advise against her and her against Pearl <laughs> she says something to the effect of um Pearl didn't suit her and then she looks at Linda Cardellini and goes she didn't have the best future <laughs> and there's a, a cutaway to Raquel Welch going like we are to presume that Raquel Welch knows that her daughter accidentally killed Raquel Welch's ex-husband. We can assume that. Or we can assume Raquel Welch genuinely doesn't know that her daughter did the, the accidental homicide, but that Raquel Welch is presumably would be concerned about her daughter, Linda Cardellini's character Chutney, potentially getting in trouble, right? Like, and yet there's this moment where Raquel Welch's character is like, 
the most important thing to her is that her daughter was complimented on her bone structure, which if you're a narcissistic, gorgeous mom, your child, and you know, you don't have to be a narcissistic, gorgeous mom to feel this way, that your child is an extension of you. So that moment, Raquel Welch's character takes as a compliment to her and it's like, like that's how important appearance is to these people. And yep. that's such a subtle, and, and Raquel Welch is hilarious in that moment. I, I, I love that. And I love that the, the big secret is liposuction. And, you know, the, this idea that <laughs> the screaming we, 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 when they find out <laughs> Allie Larder's ass right. is actually a result of liposuction. I just, just like, ah! but, but I even appreciate that line where she's like, you know, a normal human being do, doesn't have a butt like this. It's like, let's, uh, let's kind of undermine continually with this film, these notions of beauty in our culture. Right. And it's, I think that's a, it's a smart yeah. thing. There's another moment too, and I'll stop talking about this. I know we want to get to more questions, but there's a moment too. So there's a moment where like Reese Witherspoon's character, much like Cher Horowitz a few, several years prior, is still very much mired. Elle Woods is still very much mired in the world of like, um, you know, skinny equals pretty. There's a moment where she praises Brooke, Al Allie Larder's character, Brooke's classes. She's like, you can lose three pounds in one of her classes. Like it's very weight loss. You know, that's very clear. But there's a moment where... I don't remember what it is exactly, but somebody makes a comment about this has to do with body shaming or something, right? And Reese Witherspoon gets so offended and says about this fitness guru, Brooke would never call anybody fat. Like it's very clear in that, like kind of contradicts what we've learned about her character already because she's, it's, but, and, and then of course also, there's also the idea that like, well, is fat isn't necessarily an epithet. That's part of our conversation now. In 2001, the idea of just being like, yeah, I'm fat, or this is my body, or yeah, deal with it. I love myself. That wasn't there. And I think that's important to place in context for people who maybe were too young at that time, or just don't know enough about that time period, who might watch the film and love it, but like have these moments where they go, oh, and, and it's really, that was another thing watching it last night. I was like, well, how would we talk about bodies differently in, in this time period right now? Um, what would we talk about there? What would happen there? And I think it would be a more evolved and advanced version of that, which was honestly, it's sad to say, but in 2001 to have a character in a film be like, you know, sh basically a version of what today would be called body shame, somebody saying she would never do that, was like unusual in a, in a mainstream screwball comedy about beautiful people. And so I, I, in watching this movie, I was like, there were so many things where I was like, oh, that was the seed of something we would see differently today. And that doesn't mean that I don't love the film, I, I do. I, I can look at, personally, I can look at stuff that I wrote in two years ago and be like, oh, that, that could have been way better and way more thoughtful. And I don't look at this film that way, to be clear. I'm, I think most of us who are artists, right, we're generally more critical of our own stuff than anybody else's. Um, or at least I know some people who, who, who are the same as I am, but it, it really got me thinking about what had been in the ether at that time, what was in the cultural soup that we were swimming in at that time in the summer of 2001. What at the time seemed revolutionary about this film was that this was a gal who was, grew to be confident in her own intelligence and her own agency. That was like a very big deal. Absolutely. So we've already gone over time. Oh my um, God, I'm sorry, I'm babbling. No, it's not you. Not not at all. It, 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 it's just because Legally Blonde is the shit. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're going to close out today with a video from one of my favorite performers, and I know it's one of Reese Witherspoon's as well, uh, Dolly Parton. She is uh, the best human being alive on the planet currently. You know, they, they cycle through, but she is the one right now. I love her. I adore her. This is one of my favorite songs by her. Obviously, she actually did a song. Her first hit was called Dumb Blonde. What I love what, about her, and this is a great quote from Dolly, is that she always sort of, like Elle Wood, is completely unfazed by her appearance's effect on other people. I mean, she uses it as a as a weapon of mass destruction, if you will. And so uh, <laughs> she, she has this great line about someone asking, you know, how do you feel about dumb blonde jokes and stuff? And she's like, I don't mind them because I know I'm not dumb and I know I'm not blonde. So, <laughs> so with that, Sarah, thank you so very, very much for being thank here today. Thank you so much. This was awesome.
here. It's amazing for you to be here. I really appreciate it. And thank you for choosing this great film. And, and we're going to go out with uh, Dolly Parton singing about the working class, nine to five. We'll see you next time. The time.